from Dr. Sue Wells from CCG, from Catherine Julie McManus and Mike Sullivan is deputising for her, and um, from Team Trina Johnson with um, Christine deputising for her. Any other apologies? Yes.
And I know that members will have questions and comments they want to make, but I think it's proper that you lay out as briefly as you can thoroughly the reasons for the decision that you made and the urgency of it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, it's a very fair and balanced and reasonable discussion. I think captures um, the key points of the matter um, and absolutely captures for me the strength of the local feeling about this issue, which we absolutely acknowledge because we are in a very, very difficult position um, in terms of the decision we have to make on the grounds of patient safety. I came into post in May of this year and we have had a decline in the AME standards for some time in Wirral. And as soon as you get systematic decline below 75% in terms of four hour waits, you're starting to do harm to patients. And that's evidenced by the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. We therefore took a number of actions during the period between June um, and July of this year, involving contractual discussions with both the community trust around the walk-in centres, because Eastern had been closed on at least three occasions because of um, the, the inability to get staff in there because the staff we're talking about, the three staff are highly skilled, are not easily available in the wider market and actually are very costly in terms of agency staff. Um, and we also have made several attempts to discuss with the hospital about delivery of their any performance. On the 13th of July, any performance went to 54%. This therefore means that people are waiting on trolleys and not being seen. This means that ambulances are waiting outside the hospital and those ambulances are not available for the wider population. On the same day, we were called, um, myself, Karen, um, well, myself, the Community Trust and the Hospital Trust, were called to see NHS Improvement and NHS England and it was very, made very clear to us that NHS England and NHS Improvement, the regulatory bodies and the Secretary of State wanted an immediate improvement in Wirral's performance and the addressing of those immediate patient safety concerns and expected by the 10th of August for us to have a plan in place where we would do, um, make some actions about putting front door clinical streaming in place as a matter of urgency, thereby taking out of a &E, people who have minor conditions and creating the conditions so a &E can actually treat those most in need. Performance in the last week has improved. We have seen an improvement in performance and we're heading somewhere within the 80th centile, but we do need sustained improvement. Without those staff helping with that screening, we couldn't have put that in place and we couldn't be um, addressing the harm that is being caused by people waiting on trolleys, by people waiting on ambulances, and by people admitted, being admitted when they don't need to be admitted into a hospital setting. We took the decision quickly and I think in hindsight I would have um, wanted to make at least a phone call to Councillor McLaughlin and to other members of the scrutiny committee to talk about this. I'm absolutely, um, I said, I, I'm, I'm absolutely aware of the strength of local feeling. Um, I've met with the Eastern Council, myself and Karen, Councillor Gilchrist. Um, and as I said to the local MP, it's not okay because this isn't what we came in the NHS to do. However, we do have an issue about people being put in danger, the most frail and vulnerable people, people who have had traumatic injuries in A&E. And I'm very clear that we as an NHS, and indeed we as a health and care system, because also social care officers have been involved in this process as well, so members of the council have been not, not involved in this in terms of council officers, we can no longer observe this situation. We can no longer continue, allow it to continue to deteriorate. So this is a temporary closure. Eastern Clinic remains open. It remains open doing dressing. It remains open doing many of the clinics it always has done. It's a temporary suspension of the walk-in services. And the walk-in services are essentially advice and information and onward referral mainly. So they're not providing the service of, say, someone like Victoria Centre in terms of the level of service, nor were they ever commissioned or funded to do so. But they do need to provide a service in the long term to the local population of Eastern. So this is a short-term measure. It's a short-term measure to turn around any performance and sustain it. Because we have a winter that's coming and we need a strong
strong AME is able to treat people quickly. We also know that flu is coming. It's been in the news in the last day or two. We've looked at what's happening in the southern hemisphere as an NHS, and we know we are in for a very, very difficult winter in terms of flu season. So the instructions from the regulators, and no doubt the instruction we will receive on Monday when we go to see the Secretary of State about the world health economy, which is one of the worst performing in the country, is to make sure that the changes we need to make get us through the winter. We are, in terms of the future of urgent care in the world, we have been preparing for some time uh, a review of that, um, of, of urgent care in the world for, for public consultation. The document was actually ready to go in April, and then we had the mayoral elections and the general election. So we're in a position where we can't share anything publicly as an NHS for the fear of it being used for political purposes. That's the rules we operate under. Subsequent to the election, um, in June, um, we had delivering the urgent emergency care review, a document that came out from NHS Improved and NHS England, which we had to respond to as a system. Uh, the community trust, primary care provision, um, the hospital trust and ourselves as a CCP <coughs> working alongside the local authorities as a co-commissioner of things like domiciliary care. So we had to respond to that and also subsequent to that we've had further guidance on what an integrated urgent care system needs to look like. So we had to take account of that and we are going to be going out in November with a full public consultation about what urgent care needs to look like and the world going forward. And that is where I would really like and you know, learning perhaps from where we could have done this a little bit better, certainly better in terms of involvement, but certainly involving local people, scrutiny panel and so on as that process goes forward, because it will be a full public consultation according to the three-month rules that will be in place. But clearly we have constitutional standards to meet. 95% of people should be seen, treated, admitted, discharged within four hours of arriving at a &E. We have a complex system that we need to deal with in terms of an aging population, fragmented services, uh, and so on. And we are in, under quite intense political scrutiny and pressure from the centre, and we are clearly operating within a fixed um, resource limit. And as far as I'm aware, there is no further resources coming to the NHS for the forthcoming winter. It's all in our baselines, it's all in the Better Care Fund, and it's all in how we're currently operating. So the report is, is there in front of members. I believe it's on the council, on the website as well. Um, as well. We have brought additional information um, in order to assist with um, answering questions from members. We do now have, and what I didn't have for you, Councillor McLaughlin, when you came to see me, was that clarity of timeline, um, which we now have in terms of contract letters that commenced on the 24th of May, um, 16 days into post, um, where well, we've had to start addressing this for the providers, but really contract letters only get you so far. Banging people who are already over, over the head of the stick, banging people over the head of the stick who are already having difficulty in delivering their services is not where we need to be. So the conversations we have had, myself, Karen, and David Allison, who's on leave at the moment, the Chief Executive um, of Rural Hospitals, is that actually we are in this together. We need to act together, we need to move together, and we need to ensure that we get the services back into Eastern as quickly as possible, the services are appropriate to meet the needs of Eastern residents. Because we're absolutely clear there is an ageing population there, but there is also a population of young people with their families who need access to good quality information in the files. Finally, taking on board your point about travel, we've engaged in emergency travel in the discussions about the future of urgent care, so they will be advising us on bus routes, etc. I admit we missed that in terms of the, the timing of this, but subsequent to that we've had conversations with emergency travel, and if there appears to be a need expressed by the local population, we're quite happy to have those discussions with emergency travel about restoring some level of transportation to enable local residents to get to our park if that's the place that we need to be.
ask you to answer this because we had this discussion the other day. Mm. Why planning for this situation could have taken place a lot earlier? Um, if I'm comforted to hear that you are saying that this is a short-term measure and your plans are to reopen East Clinic, and that is something that we really would welcome. Uh, but I'm going to open it up now. We've got David Burgess, Joe Paul Stewart, and Mike Sullivan. Have you probably started looking at this? Sorry, I've not taken anybody from the body of the hall. David Burgess, Joyce. Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, Mr. Banks and uh, Mrs. Howell. I, I, I've got probably a little bit of a two prong one here, but I'm just a bit curious. Um, you've obviously done something in haste, which, which you've expressed to, to the panel this evening. Um, and we all in business have to try and do something along those lines. So I, I'm just curious, really, the first part is. What sort of practicalities did you go through? So were there a number of options? Because these are really binary. There's usually uh, a couple of options that you, can, you can go through and explore and sort of clearly throw down some early doors and others might be a little bit more thought required. So there's that. But I think also, and I think this is something the chair's definitely picked up on, how temporary is temporary? Because one has to suggest that, I know you've got a review in November, and I'm just wondering if this is going to be kicked into the long grass until November and never ever yeah, uh, I'm happy putting words in your mouth, but I genuinely appreciate your comments. Thank you. I'm going to, if you don't mind, um, Simon, I'm going to take a couple of questions yeah. and then you can reply. It's the best way of getting through Thank you. Um, and concentrating people's minds. Uh, Paul, you're next.
is not something, as I said, that we, we've taken lightly, um, nor that we are particularly, I suppose, proud of because it is a very, very difficult decision. But we are in the world at the moment of very difficult decisions in the public sector. How temporary is temporary? I would want, we are reviewing this on a weekly basis. We're looking at how um, far we are in terms of the phasing in of front door clinical streaming. If that is embedded, if we are seeing an improvement in any performance, we will be moving to restore services back to the Eastern Walking Centre. In what well, walking services back to the Eastern Clinic, I must stress that there, is no, there are no plans to close Eastern Clinic, nor has Eastern Clinic been closed, um, as, as some reports would suggest. And there are still services in there, and the majority of services the walk-in facility provided, which were dressings, <coughs> still continue to be provided there. So the dressing service is still there. I would need to go back and look at the detail of the, um, the equality impact assessment. The equality impact assessment would have covered, or should have covered, disability pride communities. You're absolutely right, Councillor Stewart. Um, we, again, that is a, a living document that is reviewed regularly, so the document you probably have in front of you is, has, has, has some uh, shelf life upon it. But when you're in this sort of situation, you also are held to account by NHS England in terms of them sense checking that air quality impact assessment, the quality impact assessment generally. So what I would like to do is that, that question to go away and give you a, a give the councillors, scrutiny councillors a more um, informed answer in terms of if there is a gap, why was there a gap and how are we going to fill it in terms of the patient figures and deprived communities. In terms of usage of walk-in centres, it wasn't absolute in terms of numbers. We actually looked at what the walk-in centres did in football, hours of opening, um, what the centre provided in terms of did it then onwardly refer more people than others, and it does. Um, it onwardly refers more people because it's there mainly for dressings, for advice and information. When you compare that to the other walk-in centres, such as uh, um, Arrow Park Walking Centre, Victoria Mine Injuries, they have more um, services within them because they were commissioned to do that in terms of diagnostic x-ray, uh, echocardiogram and so on. Eastham has always been nurse-led. Um, it's always had, it's mainly a primary care condition, so it's effectively um, an extended primary care facility rather than a walking centre. Um, and then has never had GPs or um, physician support in it um, in terms of um, what it was commissioned to do. Handling the calling, well, I always accept that there are things we can learn from what we've done. Um, and I would take, you know, it, serving the public good is also sometimes about trade offs. And as I said, we have older, frail people lying on trolleys in corridors at Arrow Park Hospital and sitting in the back of ambulances who we had to make a judgment about in terms of their need, I suppose, versus that of the local people in Eastern. And I have said to local people, to, to well, the representatives of local people, local councillors, I can actually appreciate, and to the local county, I can actually appreciate Eastern people perceive this we have taken a hit for the rest of the world, for the greater good of the rest of the world. Um, and that's not a great place to be and I absolutely acknowledge that. Um, but we we have, as I said, if you have ambulances sitting outside AE, they're not available for the rest of the population, not just for our population, but of Western Cheshire and beyond, because they're not on the road and they're not therefore responding to blue light calls, etc. So, last item was why Eastern. I think I might have picked that up in terms of um, a discussion between the three um, organisations, actually four organisations, because it included the local authority social services teams as well. We looked at a variety of factors. We discussed the NHS England and NHS improvement, and uh, that's where it proceeded from. So there was a procedure, there was a process. Um, it clearly. Um, was more of a responding to an urgent need process rather than if we'd have done this in a formal consultation. But I actually take the councillor's point about, and as I said before, the strength of public feeling about this, 
um, the, the feelings of Eastern councillors and Eastern residents. Um, and we uh, <coughs> remain committed in the long term to ensuring that we provide services and meet the needs of that population. And I'm just going to call it a bit of a Yeah, no, I'm not asking you to talk about the bed because I don't know. It's seven people. I'm not going to ask you the right question that I asked and so which was, it isn't, a, it isn't a binary decision and Mrs. Howells nodded. It yeah. was, what stages did you go through to come to the decision you came to? Process. It, there must have been a number of options and you haven't explained them to the panel today. The option would have been to take resort. The option would have been to take resource from other walking centres who are already working capacity, which are already providing services over and above that for each one. The options appraisal was done by, by with operational staff looking at what was actually available, and these three staff were the, the people who were available and had the most skills. Again, this is a walking centre that has been shot previously on a temporary basis, <coughs> we're not been able to staff it. Would you like to explain more, Carol? <clears throat> Hopefully I can help. Good evening. Okay. Um, so, Eastern Walking Centre, we understand completely it's very valued in Eastern. And we've heard tonight that there's a time for that. I'm not here to work. Tell you what, that's the first time I've ever been told you can't hear me. I'll try again. How's that? <laughs> um, Eastern Walking Centre is a service that is very valued in Eastern community. We understand that, which is why it's temporary. You've asked the question, why Eastern? So what we did was we looked at the activity. So in other words, what, is, what are people presenting with at the walking centres across all of them, not just Eastern? Eastern is commissioned as a walking centre, but it's not a fully functioning walking centre. It doesn't have all the back office diagnostics. It is nurse-led and it provides a very good service to young families and older people. For younger families, it's generally advice. For older people, it's, ge and it's generally, but it's generally dressings and support around dressings. When we looked at the activity in the other walking centres that are commissioned as fully fledged walking centres and have diagnostics at the back of them, so that when people go in, we can actually treat and discharge or treat and refer to ED if we need to, emergency department. So naturally, the, the other factor, sorry, is that Eastern is only commissioned to be open from 2 p.m. to 10 on Monday to Friday, part-time at the weekends as well. So, in this case, which I must stress, and I am a qualified clinician, and a &E was my subject. So I know what I'm talking about. In this circumstance, because these three staff are qualified in a way that could help Arrow Park Emergency Department stream patients, in other words, assess, triage, and divert away from the emergency department so it could become more efficient, because it needs to, because it's not performing as well as it should, they were the three staff that we could deploy quickly on the grounds of safety. And I must stress that. We have not made an arbitrary decision on the grounds of, well, let's pick on Eastern or let's go for the easy hit. Absolutely not. I can understand completely why it must look and feel like that. I really can. But it isn't. It was about getting through those three staff to the front door of the emergency department so that they could put streaming in place. And we have seen a quite a good improvement. In fact, only on Monday, we started tipping into the 90 percentile, which is the first time in a long, long time. Why not the other centres then? Well, our park, obviously, because our park is on the site and we're using those staff. Victoria Central, why not Victoria Central? If we removed, which is a fully commissioned diagnostic walking centre. If we remove the staff from there, we will then cause an actual bigger problem for the people that were being seen, treated and discharged from Victoria Central because they would go to our park. So that was the process. I totally understand how this must look and feel, but I can give you my absolute honest, honest um, opinion, and that is, 
We made the best decision that we could, given the horrible, urgent circumstances of safety. When you duck below 70%, there is potential harm. When you're seeing 50%, there is harm. Okay. And that's what we did. I hope that answers the question better. Okay, thanks. Sure. Sure. Sorry, can I just have a point of clarity, Jane? Do you know what? Uh, it, 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 very it, quick, because there are five or six other people wanting to do I appreciate that, Chair, but the, the, the references now are by uh, Mr. Banks of consultation involving the World Council and its officers. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, no consultation took place. Yeah. So I just want to clarify that no consultation took place with council officers. What, what you're referring to is, by default, council officers, social workers, social services, things like that, will have to be involved in long-term care. That's not consultation. So I just want that absolutely clarified. That you're implying consultation took place, there was no Sorry, consultation. Okay. Uh, Councillors, you are not implying consultation took place. What I'm, I'm stating is the fact that council officers and CCG officers and health officers generally now work in an environment where we integrate commissioning and make decisions collectively. I appreciate the political dynamic in this as well, in terms of cabinet making decisions, scrutiny holding cabinet and ourselves to account and health and wellbeing board making more broader strategic decisions. But we now have an integrated commission team that involves local authority offices because that's the future where we need to give the system. However, we need to learn from this. We need to think of ways in which if we have to make decisions like this because the local authority will have to make decisions on this. The local authority will have nursing homes, domiciliary care providers and others who you've had concerns about and may need to make a sudden intervention in to rectify a particular issue around safety, um, at home, your own business, whatever. And that's a very similar situation to what we face. And what we need to learn from this is actually need to improve that communication between okay, the Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on because I know nothing. There's just one point I want to say, which we've made myself before I bring Phil in, and that is we did a review of um, task and finish piece of work, a very considerable piece of work on reducing avoidable hospital emissions. In that, we made a recommendation that there be streaming introduced at the front door of A&E, and it was. And it was removed within a matter of months. And when we were doing a, an update on the recommendations, and I asked why was it removed, uh, I was told because it wasn't effectively reducing the pressures on A&E. But that's just a comment from me, Phil. <coughs> One of the comments that Mr. Banks made was about Arakal being one of the worst problems in the country. He highlighted the situation developing earlier in the year, and he did say he was going to a meeting with the Secretary of State. Mr. Banks has said something to I can prove you right, it wasn't right to bang people over the head with a stick. Well, when the officers, or whatever level, go to meet the Secretary of State, I hope that they will bang on his desk and make the point that in our situation, whilst we're told there is money, there is a need for short-term help to get authorities and trusts through very difficult times. Having made that point, I want to underline <coughs> what I see as the anger and frustration of the Eastern people. I want to go back to when Councillor Mitchell, myself and others were pressing for this facility. It won't be a long history. But when we started asking for a facility a decade ago, we had queues of people outside of the surgeries waiting to get in. The surgeries switchboards were in trouble of trying to cope with things. And to be fair to the doctors' practices, they have tried lots of things, the triaging, the getting doctors to ring people up, having more appointments, doing more appointments in the evenings, all the local practices offers 800 appointments a week. And yet we're still in a situation where, where there are gaps, residents have to attend the walking centre. Transport, we mentioned, I'll touch on that. There's been a reorganisation, the change of the 418419. The easiest current route, if you were going by bus, would be to go into bed and have a crowd to go. Yeah. And so you get the 38 minutes an hour, to an hour bus from the Eastern. Sorry, it's 39 minutes, two from east to the 41, or 41A, or 42. It takes just an hour if you're lucky to get to our park. And we're asking people who might have children who aren't too well, who want a bit of advice that can get them to do now, 
to get on the bus and make that journey, they may be lucky enough to have family and friends in cars. And that, you know, if you're having on your neighbor door or jump in the car quickly. And even so, we are, uh, by the quickest route of the further centre of Eastern, 9.4 miles are apart by the motorway in the A41, or 7.3 miles from Bromley. Now we've heard, and it's not just an Eastern problem, I want to be courteous to all those political colleagues in the world south across all parties who are really concerned about this. We have heard that the removal of three staff is necessary to assist our park. So the removal of three staff actually inconveniences, at a minimum, 33,000 people, if not more, and more all she count in a reasonable catchment area. Three people go, 33,000 people are affected. That's why my colleagues and I are angered and frustrated about this. I want to deal with the issue of figures. I did say on the 29th of August in an email to the CCG that this matter should be done before us. So I'm grateful, Chair, that you succeeded in bringing these officers to us. I have spent a lot of time over the last few years asking for regular figures about the walk in Centre of Easton. I just say that in July this year, it had a record month, 1,411 people attending. Now this is not just a facility for Easton. 6,577 people <coughs> in eight months came to it from within the world. But 2,372 people in eight months taking last December to this July, 2,372 came over the border from Cheshire. So we're actually meeting a need not just for the world, but for people over the border. Therefore, that's why I understand the involvement of Cheshire Western Council. I understand the involvement of the MP Justin Madders in his report. And as a council, we look forward to their support. The reference was made by the officers to the temporary closures. Yes, I can say that as soon as there's been a temporary closure and the notice has gone on the door, all councillors have heard about it. That very morning, uh, 5th of August, closed. I don't know if half an hour that something happened because we were talking about it. So we're expecting to people to go. Now, now I'm talking about this temporary issue. <coughs> when Councillor Mitchell, Councillor Carabee and myself, went to meet the officers, we were given a little bit of notice. We were asked about the 18th of August. No question about why we have to go and see them. Please come and see us. So we chose the earliest date. The day before we arrived, we got a letter. A letter was sent to us uh, giving the reasons that have been set out. But we've heard a lot tonight about temporary. The notice being given out at the Eastern Walking Centre on the desk just before it closed, said from Monday 4th September walking services will no longer be available at Eastern Clinic. It didn't say anything about a temporary measure. When I got this <coughs> report, the first word that left out to me was indeed temporary. So we have heard that there's work going on to study things. Now, Councillor Stewart asked about disability. In a paper called Equality Impact Assessment Summary, these are the lines devoted to disability. Patients may need to travel further for an appointment. Patients with some difficulties may find public transport more difficult. Well, you can say that and stick it in 10 foot high letters on the field of the walking centre because the people that are in this space are the very ones who are trapped. Children and young people mentioned <coughs> that. Age was given a positive effect and a negative effect in the summary document. Elderly people may take longer to adjust to self-care treatments. So if somebody feels unwell, they can't get into the doctors, the walking centre's shut, they're not well there and then. They may have to resort to ringing up out of our services for GPs, or even seeking one of the ambulances which you've heard is very much in the so, I, and one paragraph was also devoted to deprived communities. It should be noted that patients living in deprived, in this type here, deprived patients, may find it more difficult to access services. The very people without cars, who have got to sit on the bus for an hour, with the relative not too well, the child is not too well, these are people we need. 
I want to talk about this question of dressings. So I'm meeting with Mr. Tavels and Mr. Pax. We have some figures. We haven't done them yet. I want to believe that vast numbers of people tell you for dressings. Well, I have to understand that. I have to ask, what are the local GPs, some of whom may have backed this move, particularly a GP in a high position within the CCG to be acquainted with it, how are the local GPs going to rise to the occasion? What notice have they had of it? And what extra changes will they make? So I'll leave those points to be answered. But I want to deal with this issue of temper. We've heard this interview. We're going on publication in November for a period of consultation for the last several months. So we're in September, October, November, while well, this is only going on. And I'll turn briefly to the issue of the, the information that's being reviewed. I'm gratified to hear that there's been an improvement in a &E. I'm sure all the residents will now have a record of the low levels of achievement that weren't mentioned in earlier reports it will be mentioned tonight, we'll probably also be horrified about what we've heard and also expect you, know, when you go to see the Secretary of State, to say, look, there's a problem of recruitment. I could say things about pay and pay freezes and pay pauses and who's been treated fairly, but it's a question of grades and having staff that can train and move up grades to tackle this problem. We're told in the documents there will be a review. I want this to say it's going to be over and above our usual process with weekly review. This will include safety huddles across partner organisations to assess the impact of the changes. It talks about demonstrating a clear reduction in avoidable harm. Well, another place I see huddles is a notice in ASDA where the staff have a morning huddle to talk about what their sales figures and things like that. I hope this huddle is one where we have a frank look at the problem that we assess that Eastern, that end of the borough, with all the 31,000 <coughs> people affected, have said that impact of the public concern will mean that this is a detailed study and not the kind of brief paperwork we've had so far. And if we are in a position as a committee to say to the CCG officers, say, frankly, it's not good enough. Temporary closure isn't good enough. Get it open at the earliest opportunity, then that is something I'd like this committee to consider. Thank you, Joe. Sorry for so long. It's okay. I'm just going to put them to say it's a good answer. Thank you.